Hey, good morning. Uh, the gospel will be preached this morning. <laughs> and there can be some technical difficulties, but uh, that's fine. You, you can see that I brought some things with me here this morning. Uh, uh, I'm sure if my mother was watching this this morning, she would be wondering, what am I doing with these jeans here? Um, I, actually, I, I, th these were new, and I, I bought them uh, not too long ago, but um, it didn't take long for that knee to wear out. And then I thought, oh, I can't wear them anymore. And then uh, I thought, wait a minute. Wait a minute. People are spending a lot of money on, you can get that for, like, you, you can buy that new. Already like that. So I decided, all right, I'll just keep wearing them. So if you see me around now, you, you, we have something to talk about. I um, also brought some tools with us. Uh, Kimberly and I, um, uh, in our house, we recently um, decided we were going to finish our garage, um, which meant that we, it was already drywalled, uh, but there were lots of holes. We had to do lots of repairing before painting. And uh, as I was thinking about the sermon this, uh, this morning, uh, I was reflecting on some of these things. And so uh, that's why I, I have these here. And we're going to talk more about that later on. But I thought I'd clear that up so you're wondering what's going on. Um, we have, uh, we're concluding our sermon series this morning. A More Excellent Way. And uh, that subtitle, Christians in the FHL, stands for Faith, Hope, and Love. And we are uh, finishing our uh, talking about love again this morning. And the driving question is, how is our love life? And uh, that might sound kind of personal. Uh, it might sound kind of strange. And I suppose it depends on what definition we give to love or description of love. And we're speaking particularly of the, well, now the Greek word agape, but it's that uh, relational, people-oriented love. And if I ask that question, how is our love life? Some of you might say, well, maybe it's kind of a lot like uh, my, my jeans or maybe our garage that needs repair or upkeep. And we recognize that things in this life of ours need repair and upkeep. Um, it's pretty clear. If there's one thing we've learned over the course of the last couple of years is that how the environment that we're in and the elements that we're dealing with in life are frail, faulty, and in fact can uh, fall apart uh, in economies, uh, small businesses, big businesses, supply chains. On the weekend, we uh, empathized with our provincial neighbor because it was just a, a storm and a flood. They've had fires and smoke in the summer and now this, and it just is ruinous. So things can uh, fall apart. They can deteriorate, and we know this. And, but what's interesting to me is when that happens, and over the course of the last couple of years, what draws our attention? What gets our focus? Well, some people talk about politics and politicians, and they follow them. And what's interesting to me is people that might not have been like following the news or on social media as much a few years ago are now gangbusters. They're, they're like expert social media information gatherers, but in a, not necessarily in an academic way, I'll just say. Um, so we might follow, you know, uh, follow news, we might follow politics, we might follow economies. But then even people that go to church, people that consider themselves to be religious or Christian, when we talk, it's interesting if we reflected honestly and transparently how we converse with each other even on matters of, let's say, religion or Christianity. It seems to me that a lot of conversation is about um, sort of right and wrong. It's about uh, what I think or what I believe. And even people use these words like uh, my position. Well, this is my position. 
it's almost like a, a chess match or something. And this morning we are going to go uh, back into the letter of 1 Corinthians, the letter that Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. And they also struggled. They recognized the realities of life, that it was frail and faulty and that things could unravel. And as we have been talking about, one of the reasons they recognized this is because when they made a choice and a decision to be a, a, a Christian and to follow Jesus, it had huge impacts to their daily life. M many of them would have to have changed jobs that changed their line of work. Many of them, that created division within their own families. And for those that were Jewish, they would have to uh, leave the synagogue, the whole community. It would be like today, uh, giving up your bank card, your credit card, changing your job, maybe like, I mean, it was significant. And so they recognized the frailty and faultiness of, the, of life around them. But it was interesting that this was also happening inside their church. That there was difficulty and this uh, 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 challenge within their church as well. There was uh, division in their church as they were coming together from all these different backgrounds. Uh, the there were people that were extremely wealthy that were in their church, and there were also people that were very poor in their church. And what we learned from Paul's writing is that there was a division among the, the people that were wealthy and the people that were poor. Just like it would have been outside the church, that kind of division was also now present in the church as well. Even when it came time to things like communion. And we talked about the realities of uh, sexual immorality because of their uh, being influenced by the temple up on the uh, Acro Corinth, on the, on the uh, equivalent of Nose Hill, the sexual immorality. But even we learned through Paul's writing that uh, they would even do things like um, have lawsuits among themselves. Can you imagine uh, people in the church suing each other? So they were subscribing to the same kind of systems and structures that was in the world. They were still using those and engaging with those even while they were in the church. Sort of following that. And so Paul was writing to try and, and, and bring some uh, clarity back to this. And so no wonder the, the letter to Corinth has 15 chapters. No wonder by the time he gets to chapter 13, he's really moving towards this discussion about love and the primacy of love and what it is and what it is not. And so this morning we're considering how is our love life? What is our love life? And we're going to take um, this morning, going to have a, a bit of an extended Q&R time. So if you're joining us by live stream, you can Text or email to ask at westviewchurch.ca. You can do that here in the sanctuary or you can stand up later on. A bit of an extended time. We're hoping to uh, uh, open up for questions. Um, I know uh, some of the young adults have had questions over time and we've received some good ones in the last few weeks. And so we want to do that this morning and whether it's about faith, hope or love. So let's do that. So let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Starting at verse 8. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 8. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part, but when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide. These three. 
but the greatest of these is love. Well, this is uh, good news, friends. Uh, there's some fantastic news here. This is central to the gospel. And what Paul is saying out of the gate is, he says, initially, love never ends. Uh, the Greek word is pipto. It's forever. Love is forever. It doesn't end. It goes on and on and on and on. And uh, he, he describes um, what I call a progression. And in your uh, bulletins, you will have uh, this, this table. And you can see it on the screen there as well. What he's doing is he's making a very bold statement about agape, love. And that it is forever and that it is without end. And then he makes some explanation. And one of the things he's describing is this progression. And he says, listen, um, there's a progression in life that we know about. When I was a child... When I was a child, I talked like a child. And then as I became older, I became an adult and I gave up childish ways. And you know this to be true in your life as well. You know if you're a basketball player or a hockey player or if you um, were uh, in, in elementary school and now you're in high school or you're in your first, your second year of university. You know that what you were doing when you were in elementary school and how you think and how you consider things now is different. The way you handle your sports, the way you handle your academics and your relationships is different. He's talking about this progression that we know about. He's also talking about this aspect of time, that there is a now and a later. And what's interesting to me in the course of talking about both this progression of maturation and this uh, movement of time, what's interesting is he said, talks about that we know uh, now like looking in a mirror. And it's interesting to me that he uses that as an example that when we think about ourselves and we think about life, it is um, dim, it's obscure, it's, it's a bit mysterious. And if we pause long enough, we go, yeah, it's true. There's things that are kind of a bit of a mystery. We don't really know. And, you know, I read this book on quantum mechanics uh, by this uh, scientist. And he was saying, you know, uh, at the end of the day, there's a lot of things that we have difficulty explaining, even through all these sort of uh, intricate um, uh, tests that we do. And he says, we, we, it's a mystery to us. And yet, as scientists, we will still attempt to explain it. I thought that was pretty interesting. But there's a sense that what Paul is saying is there's this progression of maturation. There's this movement of time. And what he is saying is that through all of that, in the world we understand that things need repair and things break down. But when it comes to love, love grows and grows. But love transcends this. Love continues through all of that. And finally, it is ultimately through all eternity. God is the one who defines and describes this agape love. It is forever because God is love. He is forever. He is the one that defines and describes what true agape love is. He defines it. He deposits it in the congregation, in our hearts, and he develops it. He loves primarily and eternally. There is no off switch. And he demonstrates and he expresses his love most clearly and uh, uh, succinctly through the life of Jesus Christ. And so we understand who God is and what love is like through the life of Jesus. And so then we come to understand that this divine love, this agape love, is about relationship. It's about rapport. And that love is expressed and demonstrated through presence. And presence can express and demonstrate love through presence. And it's amazing to me how we think through the course of what agape is and what love is. Because love is also the means. Love is the way that the Lord relates to us. 
Love is the way that he encourages uh, us to relate to each other. That love is a mark, an attribute of the congregation. It is a particular attribute, a, 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 a gene, if you will, <laughs> a, a, a marker of followers of Jesus. It is this love. And I know that people have doubts. Sometimes we wonder, is it like, what if, what if I'm expressing love but people misunderstand? Or they misinterpret? What if love isn't enough? <laughs> you know, maybe I need to also try something else in addition. But I wonder, what else is there to try than to begin with love? But love, friends, is the power and the means. We understand this most popular verse in John 3.16. For God so loved. Because God loved, He sent His Son. And Romans 5, verse 8. God demonstrates His love toward us. In that while we were still sinners, while we were still doing these wicked things, Christ died for us. So love is the means to our salvation. It is the means of how we are rescued and saved. It is the very nature and character of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So if it is more than enough, it is the very starting place, it is the very point of our Salvation, it is through the Lord Jesus Christ. Love breaks down all the sinister, wicked, evil uh, things that are going on in the world. Love, you know, is like that water. Uh, Steve Cripps and I were on a hike and we're looking at this water coming through the rocks. And apparently just all year long, but it can mold and shape and carve into rocks. Love is like this powerful force. So when we ask the question, how is our love life? How is the agape? How is our agape? Well, considering what is agape is like, we can say that our agape is an eternal, indestructible treasure. It's an eternal, indestructible treasure. And I use that word treasure on purpose because it is something that is forever, it is without end. So that means that our future with the Lord will absolutely include love. Love completely. If, if love is a child right now, love will be an adult in eternity. There will be love and no wickedness or evil. So this love, this love is a... Is a our, our destiny, and that's why I call it a treasure. Jesus speaking in Matthew, he says, talks about, uh, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal. Don't lay up for yourselves treasures where it requires tools and screwdrivers and pliers and, and all of these things. And don't make that the focus of your life where you're going to need to repair, fix, and patch. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth or rust destroy and thieves can break in and steal. There is another treasure. And that treasure, I believe, is shaped and includes love. 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 He, he said that faith, hope, and love abide. He said, now, faith, hope, and love abide. So, hope abides. So, we, we have hope. The reason love is the greatest is because that it is forever and without end. The reason love is the greatest is because even though we have hope, our hope is... Paul in Romans says that love has been poured out into our hearts. We have hope. We believe in a future that is good. That future, we believe, is one that has love. 
Because of love, we have hope. Every moment that we experience or we express love, it gives us hope. And we understand that there will come a day when there will be only love and no wickedness. So, hope is funded by love. And then faith abides. Faith, as we talked about, was belief and action or uh, belief plus trust. Believing. So, we believe and understand about love. We cognitively, we can grasp that, but we take action and we trust and we move forward and we take steps because we have been given love, because we are loved, and also we take steps in love, in agape towards others. So our faith too is funded by love. Love is the greatest. <laughs> It's such a fantastic and bold statement. I use the phrase, when I refer to us, I use the phrase followers of Jesus. I use that, or sometimes disciple, which is student of Jesus. And I use that even over and above the term Christian or believer. I use it because it is so descriptive and particular. And in today's world, everybody is clicking on follow. You can follow on Facebook. You can follow on Insta. You can follow on a couple of these other apps that I'm not going to mention. But we follow Jesus. We follow a particular way. The Jesus way, the way of love. It was the way that Jesus related to people. The way he talked to people. The way he cared for people and it's not about following a politician. It's not about following the money or uh, economics. And I know, like, I play hockey. And so, you know, I, I watch, well, my team is the Leafs. Um, although although um, I am watching the Flames as well, and, and, um, and they're doing well. But anyway, I digress. Uh, so I will watch them a little, and then I'll try, you know, and see, okay, like I'm a right winger, so I'll try and see what, what, are, what are they doing and see if I can emulate that when I'm playing hockey. It doesn't quite work out the same. But in terms of who I am and my being and how I, I conduct myself in life, whether I'm in school or whether I'm in the workforce or in the community or raising a child, a follower of Jesus, we are clicking on Jesus and following him to decide how we're going to live. And he is demonstrating love. God is demonstrating his love towards us through the life of Jesus Christ. So we follow him. And it's persistent. Love is persistent, particularly in this sort of fallen and wicked environment that we're, we find ourselves in, this frail and faulty environment. And so it is a treasure. And so if this is a treasure that is our destiny that, that, that cannot end and is indestructible. And if this is where our future lies, then what Paul is inviting us and he's inviting the first church Corinth to do is to express, to experience that love, to say yes to Lord, I want that love. I want that kind of love in my life. I accept that love in my life. I understand that that's the way you relate to me. That is the way you relate to me. And then expressing that love. In other words, that that love can be expressed and given in the present. In fact, I'm going to make a bold statement here and say that when we express love, when we are loving towards somebody else, that that is a moment where the kingdom has come. You are handing out eternal, indestructible treasure when you, when you love. Those love acts, I'm going to walk here so the, the, the um, camera people are going to be a little, but I want to hand out some love. <laughs> Um, and we'll see. I'm going to toss this. Are you you're willing to catch? Okay. And I'm going to toss this. Are you willing to? Are you going to catch? One more. One more. It's it's chocolate. So, uh, um, so if you're allergic, 
um, then don't eat it. Here, there's one more. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm practicing my, my throwing. Um, let's see, Janae. Why not? You got exams. You got to keep the chocolate rolling. <laughs> Midterms, they never end. Um, I'm going to ask the, the music team to come up, and we're going to spend a few minutes in Q&R. But this is the, the, the good news, first of all, that love never ends. I mean, three words. Or love is forever. There's no off switch. It's indestructible, and it's a treasure. But also the good news is so that we can express that. We can give those moments out. We can express love and begin to fund other people's hope. We can begin to fund other people's faith, other people's imaginations for what the Lord is like, what our congregation is like, what Jesus is like. So I want to pause here and see if you have some questions. Um, we'll, we'll take that. Yeah, I've got your mic there, uh, Manuel. Do you have a, a question? Uh, currently, there are none on the inbox, so okay. if you're watching on live stream or here and you'd like to be, remain anonymous, you can send your question to ask at westviewchurch.ca. Yes. Um, but I'd like to start off with a personal question okay. that I know I had for a while. Maybe that'll help prime everybody uh, to the thoughts of, of, of curiosity about this. Um, how do I know personally, how can I quantify uh, to myself? that I am, I am loving, not, not characteristically, but I've, I've done love today. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. yeah, 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 that's good. So how, how, how can I sort of quantify or how can I break this down to, to really get a sense that I have done some love today, that I've expressed right. love and experienced love, right? Yes. Yeah, that's very good. And, and, and this is, I, I believe, this is what actually Paul is trying to get the church in Corinth to do and what the Lord through inspiring this in Scripture is, is getting us to do. And that is that w the gospel, uh, there, we're being invited to be shaped by the gospel and our conversations should be shaped by the gospel. Wouldn't it be interesting if we spent time talking about love and understanding love and what love is like or understanding what Jesus is like so that it informs our narrative, that it actually shapes what we talk about. And so this question is a good question. How can I tell that I've been loving today, that I've expressed love today? And I want to do two things here. Uh, the first is the, the experiencing God's love. It's so important that you have some time with the Lord where you can open up and listen to God speak to you. Because invariably, one of the first things he will say to you is, I love you. And what the enemy wants to do is get us busy and our schedule and calendar full and that we are hectic and we don't have space and time to spend it with the Lord and to actually receive and accept all this love that he has for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his son. God demonstrates his love toward us. He is just a fountain of love and we're too busy. Do you see what I mean? Spend time and accept and receive his love. Understand that you have it. And then explore what is love. What, tangibly speaking, it's action, it's a posture, it's something towards someone else, it's other-oriented. So Paul described a few things, and we have that chart from last week. It's kind. Have I done something kind? Well, what does kind look like? Love is patient. Have, have I been patient? There are actual descriptions of what it is and what it is not. So we could also go onto the other side of the ledger, you know. Love isn't boastful. Love does not demand its own way. And then I can also say, you know what, Lord? Today I kind of, I, you know, I was keeping score, resentful. So I think there are tangible things that we can do. 
that there's these descriptions there. But I really believe that it also must be that we experience His love, that we actually experience His goodness. There's so much anxiety about the future and depression about considering the past. And I understand, you know, it's in our families, Kimberly's family, in my family, it's in our immediate family. We understand that. But perfect love casts out fear. And so the medication that the Paul and I want to prescribe for you this morning is to really take in love. I mean, spend that time in the morning and then set your alarm on your phone for 60 seconds to just receive a conversation with the Lord and love. Okay. So we don't have another question here, but if anyone here does have a question, yeah. feel free to uh, stand raise up your hand or stand. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I do have a... Oh, we just got one. Okay. The question is, if I have been hurt by the church, mm -hmm. what are your recommendations for me to move forward in believing in this concept of love yeah. forever? Yeah, yeah. If I've been hurt by the church... Uh, give me the rest of that. Then, what are the recommendations for me to mm -hmm. move forward in believing in this concept of love right. forever? Yeah. What are, what are some steps to go forward in believing in this concept of love? Love is forever. Yeah, if I've been hurt by the church. And, and first of all, I want to uh, just uh, empathize with this person about being hurt by the church. We probably all know people that have been hurt by the church. And we don't want to. Right? But we have and we do. And, and part of it is that we're human. And so I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry about that. And, I, and it's not something that we want to do. And so we want to locate, first of all, that this love that we're talking about is demonstrated through the life of Jesus Christ. Paul, uh, sorry, John writes in 1 John 4, he, he concludes with these three words. He says, God is love. So we can believe in love forever, that love is without end, because we believe God is without end. He always has been and he always will be. And therefore, there will always be that beautiful, perfect, holy love. And then he expresses that love and he shows and demonstrates what that kind of love is like, even more practically through giving of his son in the life, death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. So that's where I locate my understanding of who he is. What the church, what we are doing now is if we are committed to this, committed to following, then we begin to click follow on Jesus and we begin to be shaped, formed, and informed by that kind of love. And I would say that, so the location of it is in God and understood through Jesus Christ. And I think it is important for us to reconcile with each other. Do not allow the enemy to have you carry your wounds and your hurts in a bag forever. Allow the Lord Jesus Christ to do reconciliation, healing work in your life. And so talk to somebody about it. Let us come together. Let us be reconciled and, 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 and it, let's admit it and let's come together and be reconciled so that we can be healed. And we can be relieved of that hurt. And as a commitment to followers of Jesus Christ here, let's be committed to being open and receptive to reconciliatory work where we know that we've hurt somebody and be honest with that because we're human. Yeah, I think that's all the questions all right. that we have for this morning. Thanks. Then I'm going to uh, finish it up here. Thanks, Manuel. Mm -hmm. So I uh, want to conclude here this morning. People understand. They come to, to uh, grasp. They come to be uh, uh, convinced of something through experiencing it. The learning model is, the pedagogical model is, Tell, show, do. And it's through the experience that we come to fully understand and appreciate. And so when the psalmist says, taste and see that the Lord is good. So people understand love 
we understand it, we, we can read about it, we can hear about it, but it's when we receive it and experience it that we really understand it. And so my invitation for us this morning, those that are on live stream and here this morning, it's my invitation to us is, Westview, let's follow Jesus in this way of love. Let's join his life and his mission and his character of love. I pray, Lord Jesus, as we are here this morning, Holy Spirit, that you would pour out your spirit upon us. I pray that you would do a healing work, Lord Jesus, for those who have been hurt, those who have been marginalized, those who have felt discouraged, counted or disenfranchised Lord Jesus but that is not you you are the one who leaves the 99 to find the one you are the one who demonstrates your love toward us that you gave up your life for us that is the love the agape divine love and Lord Jesus I pray that we at Westview will step into this agape love that we will be formed and shaped and express this kind of love as we gather together here and as we go into our places of school and work and neighborhood and home. In your name, Jesus, I pray. And so, friends, when people ask us, how is our love life? Just imagine what that could be like. And especially as we go into Advent, this Advent, when I invite us, this Advent, to step into this extraordinary. Step into the extraordinary. That's what's happening at Advent. And if love is demonstrated through presence, and presence demonstrates love, then consider this Advent the emphasis of what we're doing at Advent. Is it going to be here with tchotchka and things that need repair? Or is it going to be here with the, the gold and the treasure of love? So this Advent, let's step into the extraordinary.